Once again, a big fight over international trade is brewing in America. On one side, advocating free trade are the intellectual heirs of the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith. On the other side are those who believe that Smith-style free trade threatens American jobs and industries. Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Robert Lawrence, professor of economics at Harvard University and author of Can America Compete? Jagdish Bhagwati, professor of economics at Columbia University and author of The World Trading System at Risk. James Fallows, a longtime analyst of East Asian economic strategies and author of the recently published Looking at the Sun, The Rise of the New East Asian Economic and Political System and Thea Lee, an international trade economist at the Economic Policy Institute. The question before this house, is Adam Smith a 21st century man? This week on Think Tank. To most Americans, 1776 means America's birthday. But besides a new nation, something else was born that year, a new notion of how the world works. The idea that individuals are better than the government at determining what is in their economic interests. Now, later on, we will talk about the huge new trade treaty, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. But first, let's take a look at the father of free market economics. That's Scottish philosopher Adam Smith. His book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, remains the cornerstone of modern economic thinking. In it, Smith declared that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. By intending principally to make themselves better off, Smith said, merchants, workers, and factory owners unintentionally make us all better off. Smith argues that free trade between countries benefits consumers. He illustrated his point using the homely example of a household thusly. It is the maxim of every prudent master of a family never to attempt to make at home what it will cost him more to make than to buy. In other words, why make your own clothes when you can pick them up at a department store more cheaply? Smith continued, What is prudence in the conduct of every private family can scarcely be folly in that of a great kingdom. Again, why should the United States make steel at home if it can buy steel cheaper from Korea? Now, Adam Smith surely would be pleased that much of the world is now following his advice. Trade is rapidly expanding as countries open their markets to foreign goods. American shoppers can buy ties from Taiwan, shirts from Brazil, and cookware from France, typically at bargain prices. But free trade is not without its critics, as the recent battle over NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, showed. Some say that a measure of a nation's success is not what it can buy, but what it can produce and sell. Others say free trade may be fine in theory, but we live in an imperfect world. To them, Adam Smith was a brilliant thinker, but his time has passed. Panel, lady and gentlemen, uh, my own view of the uh, debate that we had about NAFTA uh, was that it was terrible. It was a great opportunity to try to explain a complex idea to the American people, and instead we heard things about uh, sucking sounds and OMAs and dumping and voluntary restraints and 200,000 jobs lost or 200,000 lost uh, or 200,000 jobs gained. And what I would like to try to do in the first few moments of our discussion here today is to take the figure of Adam Smith, the father of this idea, and using that vehicle try to explain what it is we should have been talking about and Professor Lawrence, I wonder if you could take a stab at that. Well, I think the central insight of Adam Smith was that there are benefits to allowing individuals to specialize, that each person should do what they do relatively well. And I think he, uh, as that um, uh, citation indicated, he, he argued that this was also true of nations. And that is the fundamental idea of why free trade is good. 
because by specializing, it allows us to increase our incomes. It increases our well-being and welfare. I mean, think about it um, with a viewpoint uh, by comparison to technology. Imagine someone invented a machine that would run on water instead of uh, gas. Well, we'd all agree this would be a terrific thing. We could now save on all of those resources which we use in order to run our engines. We would also acknowledge, however, that for the oil producers of the world, this might not be a very good thing. But th for all of us, this improvement in technology would allow us to get energy more cheaply. And Adam Smith's insight was, the same proposition would hold for a nation. If you can buy things more cheaply from the rest of the world, you can raise your incomes, you can raise your well-being. So my own uh, sense of dissatisfaction with the NAFTA debate is that it didn't concentrate enough on how we raise people's living standards as opposed to the question of how many jobs we may create or lose. I wonder if I could just Please. go on <coughs> from that. I think that, that Robert has, has very, you know, very uh, eloquently summed up what is the main, the main derived lesson from, from Adam Smith's um, uh, teachings today. And I think the question, what the debate about these teachings now really concerns is the different, is whether something that is generally good is always good. Whether there, there's something that is largely good is absolutely in every single case so, good. So, so you are not anti-Adam well, Smith. No, uh, let me use, use uh, of course not. I think that there's a, a whole side issue here of whether the real Adam Smith has any relationship to the, the figure who's used as a symbol now on neckties or people right. who are, in many cases, absolute free marketeers. Let me use this illustration. We all would agree that personal liberty is a good thing, and most cases is a wonderful thing, and yet we don't feel that it is absolutely a good thing. Societies need some curbs on personal liberties at some point in order to cohere as societies. And I think the argument about free trade is whether there's any point where there are other political or strategic or other benefits that you advance by, by curtailing free trade at certain points. And, what has struck me in the last eight years of been working in East Asia is the very shrewd mixture of sort of operating principles derived from Adam Smith and a strategic intervention by the government for non-Smithian purposes. So it's, it's sort of the missing third member in the, uh, in, in the choice. Um, the central insight is that it's not just if countries have different kinds of capital or different kinds of labor that will determine what they specialize in, but it may actually be if they have different kinds of rules different kinds of regulations, and different kinds of government policies. Different ambitions. Those will also change the patterns of specialization. The yeah. point, Robert, is that as a, as a nation, we co go through a political process to decide what kind of labor regulations, what kind of environmental standards we want, and we regulate our domestic producers. Every time we import a good that doesn't meet those standards, we're undermining and putting at a disadvantage our domestic producers. And so, for us, to, it's one thing for countries to have different labor regulations. It's another thing for them to have automatic access to every other country's market in the world. I don't think that necessarily no, follows. I, I think you're wrong on that, Theo, because uh, certainly other countries have their own views about what, what, in fact, labor standards ought to be or what environmental standards ought to be. And these are legitimate differences of opinion, not in some sort of uh, self-indulgent pursuit of diversity. I mean, uh, like in Mexico, people may be interested in cleaner uh, water rather than cleaner air because they have a whole lot of problems with dysentery. So it seems to me that that translates simply into uh, what you will face in, in terms of international trade. And, and virtually everything, uh, uh, all kinds of diversity will in fact uh, play out. Now the only thing you could say is uh, that m if different countries play the game of trying to attract capital, uh, for example, uh, so uh, by lowering the standards below what they would like to do, mm -hmm. uh, simply with a view to playing this game of race to the bottom, as it is called, uh, changing uh, their uh, different jurisdictions, changing their environment regulations or labor regulations with a view to competing for scarce capital, then that could lead to everybody becoming worse off, our standards possibly getting lowered, their standards. But when you look at the empirical evidence on this, I mean, this is a theoretical possibility, but there really isn't anything very much. Uh, Jim, Jim, um, I think there's something that we're all saying that's similar to what Smith dealt with and is different from the way these issues are normally discussed in, in the press and in politics, which is that there is 
both potentially in the real world, a tension between purely economic efficiency of getting the most for consumers around the world, the worldwide efficiency, and certain political values that different nations or different organizations may have. The French may want to keep their pastures, even at the cost of having higher priced food. The U.S. may want certain labor standards, even at the cost of more expensive shirts. And so what this whole debate is about is something Smith recognized, which is the tension between economic efficiency and certain political goals. The way he showed it, what is his advocacy for a big British Navy and a sailcloth industry and other sort of national defense uh, measures. So that, that's the tension. The, the, late, uh, the late Herman Kahn once said that the best thing for poor countries are rich countries. Is, is that a Smithian notion? There's a central idea there that I think is worth yeah. emphasizing. And, and there, because a lot of people believe that what international competition is about is a zero-sum game. That somehow we're better off if other countries are poor. But in fact, uh, what trade is really about is making both sides better off. Uh, poor countries will be made better off if there are a lot of rich countries to buy what they produce. And in fact, um, rich countries will be even better off if those poor countries get richer. So uh, the central, uh, another central idea is we can all be better off together uh, rather than the political view, which is that it makes a sense to be top dog, that countries should dominate. But Robert, I think the question is, is unregulated free trade the best way for the poor countries to get richer and the rich countries to stay rich? Or are there institutions that we can build into our trading system that would help harmonize the poor countries upward to help raise their standards so that they don't get into this race to the bottom? I think that uh, in some ways you're wrong, Jagdish, that there is no evidence whatsoever that countries do compete on the basis of cutting standards and cutting environmental regulations and busting labor unions. I think they do do that. I think they get into a, um, a competition for foreign investment that they can't really avoid. And that's the reason that I think it would be appropriate and good for everybody to have some basic international rules. That doesn't mean that all countries will end up with the same labor standards and the same environmental rules. That wouldn't make sense. But some basic minimums that help protect countries no, I think I from countries, getting yeah. into that kind of countries, destructive competition. Yeah. I, I think countries do bust yeah. unions and so on, including our own. Uh, if right. you remember their control sure. and strike sure. and so and on. And that's partly uh, due to trade competition. they do that because of their own social and economic views about where they're having unions mm -hmm. do some specific kinds of things. I, there's n very little evidence of any. Uh, on they're doing it with a view to attracting foreign investment and playing this game in, is all in, I was in Malaysia, saying. The, the Prime Minister yeah. of Malaysia has, um, has said we can't afford to have labor unions because in the electronics industry, the foreign companies are saying they won't come here if yeah. we have labor unions. But even domestic, let me ask a question. Uh, can nations undermine one another uh, using trade policy? Uh, yes, yes, I, I think because, uh, and this again may be the central axis of the argument at least from my point of view the combination of politics and economics let's go back to your Herman Kahn question of whether the best thing for poor countries is rich countries if you rephrase that slightly and say the best thing for small countries is big countries or the best thing for weak countries is strong countries it becomes a much more dicey proposition because the world's history includes both this mutually beneficial trade and people pushing each other around I think in much of the outside world, those two things are seen as being connected, that economic strength entitles people to push others around. And so in much of the formerly colonialized world, they think that trade has, in fact, in many ways, made them worse off by making them weak, and that's subject to being politically pushed around. The debate over free trade is not just a theoretical discussion. It has real-world consequences for American workers and consumers. Boosted by an ongoing international free trade treaty known as GATT, world trade expanded 12-fold from 300 billion in 1970 to more than 3.6 trillion in real dollars annually and the portion of american jobs and commerce dependent on trade more than doubled rising from about five percent in 1970 to nearly 12 percent today after seven and a half years of arcane and sometimes bitter touch-and-go negotiations the latest bout of free trade talks known as the Uruguay Round were completed in Marrakesh, Morocco on April 15, 1994. At the signing ceremony, Vice President Albert Gore reaffirmed America's support for GATT. We have led the effort to tear down barriers and reject protectionism, and we will continue to do so. The new free trade treaty was signed by U.S. Trade Representative Mickey Cantor, 
In all, officials from 109 nations initialed the treaty, including delegates from Japan and Europe. Later this year, Congress will vote on whether to ratify GATT. The vote will have profound effects on how much consumers will pay at the stores, which workers will keep their current jobs, and which companies will face stiffer competition from abroad. And there will likely be one more big political fight. Jim Fallows, uh, is this GATT going to be good for America? assuming it passes? Uh, before answering that, yes, it would be on balance good for so, America. So if you were a senator or a congressman, yeah, if I were you senator would or vote congressman, for it? I, I would vote for it. But let me say something about uh, Vice President Gore's comments. I'm a great admirer of Vice President Gore, but what he says is not really true. It's not historically true of the United States, which was a very protectionist country until World War II, and it's not even true of the modern United States because it's like saying we've always supported peace. Yes, peace is a goal, international harmony is a goal, but free trade and lower tariff is not the only part of American economic policy. And it's always been in exchange for what? In exchange for what other values, political and other... So it's, uh, again, with respect to the Vice President, this gets us back into the simple sort of all or nothing uh, debate, which, which uh, hamstrings us on this, this kind of issue. But yeah, it's, it's good on the whole. I think the Vice President was essentially correct. I think if you look at the post-war period, of course everybody agrees that uh, we were protectionist prior to that. But I think if you look at the post-war period, in fact, if you look at the 1980s, it's really been remarkable the degree to which America has been moving to open its markets. We don't have uh, even the quotas we used to have on automobiles and steel. So I think, in fact, we are a pretty open market. And I'd return to the uh, whole uh, achievement that I think is represented by this Uruguay round, which I think is immense. I think, I would, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think Robert is, is basically right. Uh, the, the trend since the war has been to bring down tariffs and trade barriers, and we've provided leadership on that. I think what Jim is referring to, I think, are two things which I think are compatible with that. One is that it's, it's always an uphill battle, and there's other objectives, and occasionally you'll get a lot of noise. Uh, and two, we are not unilateral free traders. We never have been, uh, right. ever. Britain in the 19th century was the only Jim, country right. that believed in yeah. unilaterally going for free trade. It really believed in Adam Smith. Jim. Uh, yes, uh, compared to most other countries, uh, Robert, we certainly have been more free trade. And my point is the one that Jagdish was making. There have been other parts that we've been balancing and not you know, unilaterally doing it. So. Jim, yeah. a, a, a few years ago, uh, I, I don't want to mischaracterize yeah. your position, but uh, you tell me if I am, but you and a number of others were saying that because we had this uh, free trading uh, mentality right. and those uh, vigorous, muscular, uh, brilliant, hardworking, diligent Japanese had a different view in the back of their mind, uh, they were going to be the power of the 21st century and poor United States was going to look like England and it was going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, fast forward, uh, that's not what has happened. I mean, what you read now in the paper, America is not only number one, there is no number two. Japan is in deep trouble. Europe is in really deep trouble. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and with this right. terrible system, we, ha we have ended up the number one political, geopolitical, economic, cultural, scientific, and educational right. power in the world. I mean, uh, are, well, are, we, are we not doing something right? I mean, you, you say this sure, is, trade is a big issue, right. and all these terrible things are happening, right. and here but we my end turn up. to say what I, what I said. I mean, yeah. I think, as, as you know, nobody who's read m um, my work over the years thinks, I think, America is, is falling apart or has no, no merit in the world. I think that, that the great advantage of this uh, society is one you and I agree on deeply, which is its absorptive capacity to be able to bring in people from around the world. The point I was making, I think, had two, two parts, which, both of which I defend. One is that the U.S basically misunderstands what has been going on in the East Asian economies, that their goals are not ones well explained by Adam Smith, that they're basically political goals to build up national strength to offset national weakness of the colonial era and the post-World War II era. And, and second, that there is tremendous dynamism in East Asia as a whole. For the last decade, it's been the largest, fastest growing market. It will be that for the next decade. I, I, are we going to get hurt if they get richer? Uh, no, but... but or, or even if they get richer but, faster than we get no, richer. No, of course not. But again, the, what we're arguing about is the tension between strictly economic definitions of human ambition and 
politics, geostrategy, etc. From a strictly economic point of view, trade always makes, almost always makes everybody better off, including us. But it's not the only thing involved. The United States is not strictly a trading entity. It's also a military power. It's also a diplomatic power. It's also a society where people have to live within certain borders. So that is the point. There are certain political effects that can hurt the U.S. I think there's another point also uh, is... To tell us whether you favor this GATT. I think there are a lot of problems with the GATT, and if I were going to negotiate it, I would certainly do it differently. But if you had to vote on it? Uh, I think I would vote it down and let them come back to the table with a better agreement that did include international labor and environmental standards. I'd put a higher priority on that, perhaps, than Robert does. Uh, I think that's very important. I think all trade agreements should start moving towards that as we move towards but an integrated economy. Is, isn't economy. that how, how opponents, I mean, people kept saying, oh, I'm for NAFTA, but I'm not for not this, this NAFTA, yeah. as well, if there right. was a this NAFTA out there. I mean, they negotiated that, what, for three years or four I, years? I think that's exactly right, though. We have trade negotiators in this country who go into a closed room with a bunch of trade lawyers and a bunch of business people, and they come out with trade agreements no. that are very lopsided, that are yeah. serve yeah, corporations very well, true. and have very little in it for working people, the environment, yeah. look, the family look, farmers. See, yeah, you a, a, a trade war, a right. trade war that I am. harms, I think we should a trade war that harms uh, a nation, say the United States, should, inf should, as I understand it, do things, it do two things. It should increase unemployment and it should lower median wages. That, that's what the, that, 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 that's the punishment for a trade war. Now well, you, now you all have maintained that there has been a trade war. Uh, and that we've been losing it, or at least un until recently. Yeah. And in point of fact, unemployment is going down and real median uh, wages uh, during the 1980s. And I know there's an argument about it, but they have gone up. They have not gone up. Well, that's why I said, uh, you know, there's uh, been an argument about ben, it. But, ben, but, yeah. can I just yeah. sort of speak to uh, Thea? None of the free traders that I know, including, uh, I'm sure, ba Robert and myself, are perfectly happy with this agreement either. Uh, it's not the end of the so game. So you're not for this GATT either. <laughs> I mean, you, you are for no, this GATT, but uh, you would like to No, because in the course of reaching the agreement, uh, the administration did several things which I'm not very happy with. On the other hand, that's the politics of getting it through the con. And so this is not the end game. A whole lot of things which uh, Thea is worried about, like environment, labor, are going to be discussed in the next round right. or in the next set of negotiations. See, Robert. Let's just understand what this is. This has been a negotiation where the, we have 15 different major issues that were dealt with. And these were determined in, in, uh, by the United States in terms of what our priorities were right. and what other nations' priorities were actually in the mid-1980s. Right. And it has taken till today for us to come to an agreement. So let us agree that those were our priorities. They still are very important. We now have found some new ones. And this certainly doesn't uh, mean we're going to stop negotiating, but the idea that we should continuously be changing what we're negotiating ab about is simply unrealistic and not viable. But well, we're not completely changing. If the U.S. Congress told the president in the 1980s that they wanted a social clause and get, they wanted him to work towards that. That was one of the goals that was given up on fairly right. easily. The, uh, the goals that we I want to come back to that phrase, so, social clause. That, 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 that really uh, intrigues me. That, 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 that's sort of a, a neat, neat phrase. Uh, a social clause... Um, my right-wing friends would say, oh, she's talking about world government. We have world government yeah. in areas like... Do you uh, want more of it? Well, I want more of it in different areas than we have right now. Right now we have rules, and what the, the GATT, this round of GATT represents is rules that are very favorable to multinational corporations. Their investment rules, the, the subsidies, the intellectual property rights protection for copyrights and so on, are world government. We have given over uh, the right to make decisions on those areas to this inter new international bureaucracy. Let me go around the room and ask for uh, a brief comment from each of you. Let's begin with you, Thea. And it must be brief. Uh, what do we agree on and what do we disagree on? I think we agree that trade can be a great thing between nations, that there are things we can get from each other. What we disagree on is what are the proper boundaries to the trade that takes place? What is the proper set of rules that should govern international trade? Should it protect labor and the environment and family farmers, or should it protect uh, multinational corporations? Similarly, I think we agree that Adam Smith had the right, uh, the right blueprint for making bread. What we disagree about is whether man lives by bread alone. That is, whether economic welfare, how that, that ranks with other instruments, uh, other, other goals in the modern world. I, I think uh, we definitely recognize that free trade is the, is the source of tremendous wealth, 
uh, but we're also human beings who live in societies with organizations and rules. And I think uh, that tension is something we, we continuously have to straddle. I think uh, the virtue of free trade is well recognized, I think not just in theory, but also empirically. Uh, I, th I think the disagreement arises over whether it's free trade is compatible with pursuit of other objectives. I would say uh, that m many people would say that you really can't, uh, that these things are compatible. Economic power translates into political power. So many things go together rather than conflict. So I would disagree with German th um, Thea on that issue. Well, thank you, James Fallows, Thea Lee, Robert Lawrence, and Jagdish Bhagwati. And thank you. As you know, this is a new program, and we appreciate your comments. Please write to the address on the screen. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.